Welcome. Welcome to Books of Our Time, produced by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today's book is entitled, The Best Sports Writing of Pat Jordan. Pat Jordan has been one of America's leading sports and general assignment writers for approximately 35 years, has written for the most prominent sports and non-sports magazines alike, and has authored many books. He is with me today to discuss his most recent book, a compilation of his best magazine writings selected by fellow writer Alex Bell. And I am Lawrence Aravelville, the Dean of MSL. Pat, thank you for coming up from Florida. Thanks for having me. Uh, Pat, um, you, you say that Phil Hill, as he got older in his 40s, 50s, 60s, he was engaged in perfecting the past, in, in creating a past that actually never was. Uh, it reminded me of that the great the British thing, the man who never was. Um, why did you say that? Well, he was, try, he was trying to understand the past. Phil, uh, Phil was, uh, he had not, he, he not given to introspection until later on in life, and it was like a new toy for him. And once he discovered introspection, probably in his 40s, it was like a whole new toy, and he would go back to his past and say, that's why I am the way I am. That's why I'm fascinated with cars. That's why I don't I have much uh, faith in human relations. And he tried to examine the past. I don't know whether he was trying to perfect it, but he was trying to put it in some kind of logical order. And the past is not always orderly. Right. You know, you go off to war, you survive the Battle of the Bulge, you come home, you get struck by lightning. That's not orderly. You're supposed to die in war and not walking on Main Street. And Phil was always trying to put his past in some kind of recognizable order so he could fathom it. See, that's a, a little, that's, a, that's an intensely interesting point, which I will pursue. I, I was thinking more specifically of, he was creating, uh, he was redoing cars, you know, uh, what do they call those? A, uh, everything Restore? off, uh, well, I can't think of the name at the moment. Fra a frame off. Uh, Ret rotisserie restoration. Yeah, frame off, yeah, thank you. And he was making these cars even more perfect than they were at the beginning. Right. Which is amazing. That's a search for a past that never was. Right. Uh, it's a search for, per well, I'm not sure, if, I'm, I'm not sure I agree. It's a search for perfection, which he was always after. I'm not sure he was searching for a past. Okay. Phil was always in search of perfection, the perfect race, which had nothing to do with the past. He wanted to run the perfect line. I mean, race car drivers have a, a vision of a line that they're going to take every corner, how they're going to come out of the corner. And it's an artistic thing. It's almost like the perfect line drawing of a Picasso. That's right. And Phil always wanted to race the perfect line. And something always happens. The car engine skips a beat, which throws you off the line. And you never do race the perfect line. I want to write the perfect story. Yeah. I never do. Yeah. Um, you say that he was. He, be, he began to be introspective and began to try to figure out why he was the way he is or was. Um, do you find that true of a lot of people? Do you find that true of yourself, for example? Oh, yeah. But I, don't, I, I can't make a move without figuring out why I do it. You know, I mean. Have you traced any of this stuff back? What, see, you said something at lunch, and you said it, I think, on the last show that was very interesting. You attributed something to the immigrant experience which I had never really thought about my own past that way. I always attributed it to being part of the working class. But when you say it's part of the immigrant experience, of course, the two are often, we're often, often the same. same. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, the, 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 my father was a professional gambler and an Italian who was Pasquale Michele Giordano. And he wanted me to be an American. And he wanted me to espouse all the American goals that uh, were prominent. Gary Cooper, you play by the rules. You're Gary Cooper. You save the woman from the villain. Uh, you always treat women with respect. Uh, you work hard and you'll get ahead. Uh, you don't complain. A, a pig squeals. A man holds a tight lip. All these things. No such thing as in life as perfect justice. You know, you work hard and hope you get 10% back for your effort. And so I, I, maybe it was just my father. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. I think it's more of an immigrant thing 
Whereas Americans who are cavalier about America because they've been here for two centuries could be critical of America. Like, you know, most of you Northeastern liberals can be very critical of it because so who are you calling a Northeast? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, you're not like us Southern Florida rednecks, you, you know, concern. Hey, you're, well, you're who, who control every election, by the way? I hope I you guys don't even bother to vote because Florida is going to decide who's I the know. next president. I know. Don't you guys realize that by now? Listen, I'm waiting. Everything for goes every, through Florida. I am waiting for a repetition of the phenomenon which I personally call uh, 70 and 80 year old retired Jews or Pat Buchanan. I'm going to tell you, you want me to tell you why that happened? I will tell you exactly. And it's fitting justice. In Palm Beach, in all the condos, all the old Jewish condos in Palm Beach and Broward County, all Democratic, because they're all Northeastern, Brooklyn, uh, New York Jews who have come down after they worked in, uh, you know, liberal New Yorkers or Boston. And they maintain the same politics. One old man after he got out of the polls was very confused because he wasn't sure how he voted. And he said, he said, I don't know if I voted the right way. He said, well, the guy, so the reporter said, what do you mean? He said, well, the man from the Democratic Party comes in every year and tells us how to vote. And he told us to vote for number two. Okay? Number one, the man from the Democratic Party comes in every year and tells you how to vote? Excuse me? Oh, yeah, you and then pay. he told you to vote for number two. You know how the battle was let up? One, George Bush. Two, on the opposite page, Al Gore. Three, under Bush, Pat Buchanan. What did he do? One, George Bush. So he voted for the name under Bush which was number three, Pat Buchanan. That's why you got 5,867 Palm Beach Jews for Buchanan in the election. Now, I thought, and this isn't something you've written about, but it's very interesting. I thought that uh, a lot of these folks thought that they were voting for the Democrat, and they ended up, not Bush, but the Democrat, and, and ended up voting for Pat Buchanan. That's what I just said. You they said were told one was Bush. One, number one was Bush, but they were, to, the Democratic council guy or the Democratic PR guy went oh, to... Oh, because he was over there. Gore was over there. I see. You follow? The way the butterfly ballot was set up, it was, a, it was one was Bush, I got two, two was they Gore, was they and underneath they Bush two. was three, which was Buchanan, but he looked at it and he saw... The, the, the way they saw it, two was Bush is number one, so right underneath him must be number two. They didn't bother to look and see that the name was Buchanan and that the number alongside it was three. So they voted for Buchanan. And my attitude is, you deserve to lose the election. If your voters, number one, have to be told by somebody who to vote for, and then you can't even figure out on a ballot of three people who to vote for, good. <laughs> but Pat, this country since 1830 has consisted of telling people who to vote for. <laughs> well, not as blatantly as that. I mean, it's like Mayor Daley buying the election for Jack Kennedy by digging up corpses that hadn't voted in 30 years. And, uh, hey, but Nixon thought that he would, they did even worse downstate. I know it, but Nixon would never, he said I would never, he would never protest. See, this is the one thing that people don't recognize. Nixon did a noble thing. He said the country cannot go through 60, 90 days without knowing who's the president. He's, even though he knew that Kennedy had stolen the election in Chicago, you know? But, you know, Kennedy was a, a New England aristocrat who came from a father who smuggled uh, rum from Canada and uh, dealt, with, dealt with members of my ilk, the mob. And that's a family that did other fine things, too. They did? Uh, well, which, which one? <laughs> Well, I could li I could I could list starting with a small bridge on a small island someplace. Uh, I was being sarcastic, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's go back to uh, let's go back to Phil Hill. Uh, you end now, now. Phil Hill got concerned. He, he felt he had to get out of racing because he was getting more interested in other things. He was also getting more afraid of dying. And getting more afraid of dying. Uh, now. 
you ended the story of Phil Hill with uh, deaths, not on the racetrack, and a crash of a light plane outside of London with two other racers, uh, Graham, Graham Hill and Tony England. Bryce. Yeah. Why did you end it with that? Well, do you, did you read how I began it? Uh, I guess I forgot. Let me forget. Oh, this, this, you didn't do your homework. Well, you know, I'll I read, had many read years how of preparation began. of not doing my homework. This is, this is the, all stories, if continued far enough, end in death. Ernest Hemingway, Death in the Afternoon. Okay, but that was Graham Hill and Tony Brees, or however you pronounce his name. Right, oh, no, all stories, if continued far enough, end in death. Oh, you don't mean the story of an individual, you just mean the story that you were writing. Yeah, the story I was writing. That, that doesn't mean Phil Hill had to die. All stories end in death. That's what Hemingway said. And the last person I saw at that tra racetrack was Tony Bryce and Graham Hill. And a couple of weeks later, while I'm writing this story on Phil Hill, I didn't have the ending. I read that they got killed in a light plane crash on a golf course outside of London. And I called Phil Hill up about it. And he said, typical Graham. He said, they were told not to fly in that day. It was too windy, too rainy and they had a very light plane, and they were told that it was stupid, but Graham Hill was so egomaniacal and so um, not afraid of death that he could beat death any, by flying in this terrible weather, and the plane went down. So in a way, it's a curious counterpoint to the fact that Phil Hill got sufficiently worried about death that he quit what he was doing. He didn't want to die. Yeah. Whereas Graham Hill just never believed in death, so to speak. Right. He didn't. He believed that he was superior to it. It's like being proven your god. Yeah. You know that you cheat death every day, and every time you cheat death, you you've proven that you're godlike in some way. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, uh, one of those ancient cultures where they do things like uh, walk on fire or do some dangerous thing to prove that they're yeah. that they're uh, divine. All right. Now we're going to get. Speaking of the divine. <laughs> We're going to come to my absolute favorite character and story in the entire book, as I told you earlier, because the port, Frank Vieira, Florindo Vieira. Florindo Vieira. Yeah. Man, that resonates with my own upbringing to a significant extent. So if you would start out by telling, telling people about Frank Vieira, who he was, what he did, your relationships with him, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, Florendo Vieira, who became Porky Vieira, or the Pork, uh, was a Portuguese immigrant who grew up in the uh, Italian ghetto of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, he was a tough kid, absolute the kind of guy who should be served. If he didn't get involved in sports, he would have been in jail. And he became a basketball player, went on to Quinnipiac University, became the highest scoring basketball player in the country in the early 50s, early mid 50s. And the catch was he was five feet five inches tall, maybe shorter. He was, he was tiny. And, and his partner was 5'3". Yeah, his Ernie partner, Ernie Petrucciano, yeah. who was the guy who set him up, was 5'3". And they became the greatest combo in college basketball. They became very famous, put Quinnipiac on the map, which at the time was a school whose students couldn't spell the name of the school. It was a commuter school. And now their scores were being broadcast with Kentucky and North Carolina and Duke. And uh, Porky was the greatest shot maker who ever lived. And he was also an absolute madman. He once ran from Bridgeport to Danbury on a dare because somebody said he wasn't in good shape. So he took off and his friends followed him in the car and he ran all the way, it was about 24 miles. Uh, and he, uh, he was an idol of mine. And when I was a kid, I was 14, he was maybe 21. And I would go to North End Boys Club where they would play basketball. And all the college kids, guys would come at night and they'd play these tough three, four man games. And us younger kids who were freshmen, sophomore, would stand and watch trying to pick up something. These were loser sits games, winner yes. stays. Yeah, the, so, the, so the, you might have four or five teams and the, the winner kept playing. So if you lost, you might not play for another hour, an hour and a half. So it was very important to win those games. 
You want me to tell the story? About oh, yeah, yeah, please do. So now, Porky's team was tied 10-10 to a game of 11. One of his players sprains his ankle. So now, if he doesn't get another player, they've got to forfeit the game. So there are no older guys free because all the other guys were committed to these other teams that were waiting. So he grabs me, the first guy he saw, a 14-year-old kid, pulls me on the court. He tells me, he says, don't do anything. You get the ball in your hand, you just pass it to me. That's all you got to do. All right. So we, I saw well, the game starts going on. I'm out by the keyhole. These big guys are banging each other around. The ball goes up, bounces off the rim, goes up in the air. I'm looking at it, you know. Ploop, it lands right in my hand. I look. The ball's in my hand. So I figure, what the hell? I go up for a jump shot. Just as I'm about to shoot it, Porky comes leaping out of the sky, trying to block the shot. He screams at me, no, no, no. Don't shoot. I shoot the ball. He hits me and knocks me down on, the, on my rear end. The ball goes in. We win. I jump up, waiting to be congratulated. And Porky starts screaming at me. He says, nobody takes the last shot in Porky's team. Nobody ever does that. What are you, crazy? <laughs> And eventually it became a joke. Porky, every time Porky would see me, he'd pull me onto the court and he'd say to all the guys, you realize this guy, he said, he took the last shot on Porky's team. There, there are always a lot of words that are used in it when you tell it uh, orally and not on television that cannot be repeated on That's television. That's right, you have to read it. <laughs> so um, the Porky, that became my persona, the kid who was crazy enough to take the last shot on Porky's team. Yeah. Uh, and subsequently, I guess he became uh, a coach and professor at Quinnipiac. No, and New Haven. New Haven. New Haven College. New Haven College. He went to. He, he, he became a baseball coach with the understanding he would take over for the basketball coach when the basketball coach retired. Ah. Basketball coach never retired. Right. Finally, Porky gave up. He became a very famous baseball coach. He was one of the leading winners of all. Basically, had uh, Steve Bed Bedrosian the Atlanta Braves relief pitcher was one of his players. Yeah. He had a couple of guys go to the big leagues. New Haven, uh, we once had a fellow, Alan Sapp was on one of my shows, who was who played for one of Parsegian's great Notre Dame teams, and he currently is a professor at uh, New Haven, if my memory serves, and has written, writes a lot about, uh, uh, writes a lot about sports and says, yeah. I think that New Haven is uh, uh, a major school in college hockey and college baseball. Baseball, they're always good. I didn't know about hockey. Yeah, I think I think he's Alan Sack said college hockey too. H how did you happen? I mean, this is kind of an interesting story to me. How did you happen to start going to the Bridgeport Boys Club? My father wanted to make a man of me. I was grew up in Fairfield suburbs, all the wasps. We were the only Italians in the neighborhood. Kids played polite were games. Were you called basketball. Giordano then? No, I was Jordan then. You were Jordan then. Uh, my father changed his name just before I was born. Okay. He wanted me to be an American kid. Okay, okay. So when uh, we played all these polite games, you know, if you breathed on somebody, they said, excuse me, and all that. And uh, my, my father wanted to send me back to the city, Bridgeport, to play basketball. My mother says, oh, no, it's too tough for Patty, you know. And my father said, precisely. <laughs> so he, sh he would take me to the North End Boys Club. I started going when I was like nine years old. There was no baseball there. It was only basketball. Baseball you played in my hometown. Did you end up taking the bus yourself, or did your father always drive? Uh, they would, they would, the bus didn't go there. Didn't go there. If it would have taken me like four or five transfers, it would have taken me half a day. So they, they had to cut through from Fairfield to Bridgeport, which an odd route. And anyway, uh, so they would drop me off at 9 o'clock in the morning and pick me up at 9 at night. And they'd give me a buck for lunch. And maybe maybe dinner too. Yeah. And I would go down to this little Italian deli. I'd get a salami sandwich, a yellow apple, and a coke. That's all I ate. That would be breakfast, a lunch, and that would be dinner. And uh, I'd play basketball from nine at night, at nine in the morning to nine at night. Still sounds like heaven to me. <laughs> it was. And then when the kids, when I would wait for my parents if they were late, all the city kids I was playing with head off into the night on the city streets. And I always wondered what they were doing. You know, they were chasing girls or hanging out in front of candy stores. And, you know, they were yeah. still living in a yeah. ghetto. Yeah, yeah.
and uh, I was going back to the suburbs, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, now, when Vieira played, it was back in the days, this was just at the end of the days of the two-handed set shot. Right. He still had a two-handed set shot. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, why don't you describe his various shots? Because uh, the description in the book is really, I, I, can, I can see it in my mind's eye as if I were there. Uh, Porky, Porky had very small hands and very small feet. You know, you know, the thing with basketball players, they always have big feet, Shaq, 23 size four. Porky had a, a girl's foot, you know, six triple A or whatever, tiny hands. So, you know, you're taught when you shoot a jump shot yeah. to spread your fingers to control the ball. He couldn't do that. So everything Porky did, he used his hands like a seal's flippers. Yeah, right. His fingers were always close together. For example, when he threw his jump shot, he flipped it flipped like it this. With the wrist, yeah. With his wrist, because he didn't have that strong hand. When he threw his set shot, he held it, so he, he couldn't grip it like this, like the old fashioned, so he'd have to hold them close together and he would throw it like this. He would have to get a, he was a small guy, he would have to get like a little momentum. Yeah. You know, the, you suppose in those days they threw, remember uh, Dick McGuire held a set shot here and then flipped it with his wrist? Right. Porky would have to go, you have to build a little momentum to shoot it. Because he built a lot of momentum and the shot wasn't that quick, he had to really loft it high. So his, his shots were unbelievably high. They were like coming from Mars when they landed <laughs> on a basket. You know what I mean? Like Jerry West had a, a, almost a line drive yeah, jump right, shot. Right. Kobe Bryant has a, a jump shot on a line. Porky's was a fly ball jump shot. And his, the, he was, had a very elemental game. He had three shots. Set shot if you didn't get close to him. If you got close to him, he would hook your left his left leg around yours and then go by you because you would already have hooked your leg so you couldn't turn around. And, the only thing you could do is follow him. Mm -hmm. once, mm -hmm. you, once he got in front of you, the game was over. Right, right. And then he had all these elaborate hook you shots. You describe his jump shot as coming from the back of the head. He wasn't strong, so he couldn't throw a jump shot like this. Yeah. He had, a, he had to flip it yeah. from, so he would, he would jump, fall back, and then let the ball drop almost to the back of his shoulders yeah. and flip it straight up like that. Whereas a jump shot you see the guys doing today, they get it right up here and then just use it from their forearm to their wrist. Porky had to use it almost like a catapult. You know who shoots like that? Nowitzki. Nowitzki? Okay. Yeah, well, I think. But he doesn't get it, but he get, he's got huge long, he's seven feet, he's got very yeah. long arms, and the, bat, the ball, I think, is back somewhere about the back of his head when he lets it go, and he falls back. It's an impossible shot to block. Well, that's the Porky's, even as small as he was, and he would fade back. I mean, even if he drove towards the basket, once he came up, he was still fading back. Yeah, yeah. It, it, which is one of the other things he was able to do. He was able to move forward and go back on a dime. Yeah, and he, he never ran out of gas. Just wore you out. I mean, you, you, you know, you, you'd be 0 for 10, start the game, end up with 68 points. <laughs> yeah, you tell a story. Yeah, and you couldn't embarrass him to stop shooting. He just kept shooting. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think with the last program we discussed, it uh, doesn't always pay to be too intelligent <laughs> or sensitive. That doesn't pay to be too no, sensitive. No, it doesn't. Um, he once outscored Will Chamberlain, apparently. Yeah, in the Catskills. I, I never asked Wilk about that. In the Catskills, in the... He would go up there and uh, 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 old Jews would tell the Schwarze, the Schwarze, and the um, let's see what the hell did they say? Well, I know the word, but it was a not Hispanic? very nice word for uh, for, for Puerto Rican. For or Puerto Rican, they would yeah. refer to him as Puerto. And and Porky outscored them, and uh, he uh, came down. One of the big things was. Porky came down on a fast break with only Wilt there. Yeah. And Wilt figures, and he's 7'4", this ant is coming down there, and he's going to... So he stood at the, at the keyhole, and Porky went up at the, key, at the foul line, which is playing into Wilt's hand, and he's standing there. So Wilt just put his arms up, and Porky went up to shoot a, his, one of his best shots was a hook shot off the wrong foot, 
that he threw from his hip. He didn't go out like this. He fired it from his hip and put backspin on it so it hit the top of the, the uh, backboard and spun in. And Wilt knew this. So Wilt knew he had to get way over Porky because he was going to fire the ball low from here. So you had to get over him. So you get way over him like this, waiting for that hook shot. Porky goes up like this, and at the last minute, swoops his arms down under, under uh, Wilt's hand, puts a little cue ball spin on the ball, swish, <laughs> brings down the house. And, and he actually outscored Wilt that game. 35 to 22. Yeah, yeah. Nobody and stops the Porky. People don't, kn today, most people don't know the names Bill Spivey or Jack Molinas. Spivey was on the uh, 48 uh, the Kentucky basketball Spivey team. And Black Jack Molina, Kentucky. Yeah. They were both uh, kicked out for f fixing, uh, you know. Fixing games. And so he'd have to, he'd play those guys in semi-pro games. But those were NBA ga players who just couldn't play in the NBA because they were blackballed. Yeah, yeah. And he'd outscore them. Oh, Porky outscored everybody. He outscored Hot Rod Hunley. He, uh, the, the knock against him was they were going to beat him up on defense. In other words, he's going to have to check if some guy who's 6'4", the and they're going to beat him up. But um, he never got the chance. You know, just like Calvin Murphy was supposed to get beat up on defense, 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, uh, I don't remember anybody beating up Calvin Murphy, you know. <laughs> but that was the knock against the pork. Yeah, so he never, he never did get the chance. No. Uh, you know, uh, speaking of uh, speaking of uh, Wilt, you really liked Wilt a great deal, didn't you? I thought he was a great man. He, he was uh, he had very infectious enthusiasm, and he was almost childlike in the in the way. And, and a lot of times he would say things that were not politically correct or whatever, like the idea that he had twenty thousand women women, in, and he wrote in his book. And then he was embarrassed by it. He said, oh, I thought about it. I might sell some books, and now I'm embarrassed that I said it. He says, you know, he, he, the way he justified it now, he said, I guess it proves I was such a lousy lover. Nobody came back a second time. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, he, he said things that got himself in hot water, but it was said out of in innocence, you know? Well, you kind of describe him as a man of many abilities. He, he designed a car, which didn't work. He designed his house, which was... Oh, it was horrible, the house, you know, but every, my favorite is still, he held his breath at stoplights to see how long he can go. Played mahjong with old ladies. Uh, uh, he was a terrific person. I like Will. He, uh, he got along with people of every race and religion. He had no problems that but, way. No, my wife got along great with Will. He, he's part Cherokee, part black. He was, I think it's on his mother's side. He was Cherokee Indian, and his, uh, or maybe his father, I'm not sure, but he was, grew up in North Carolina, and he had, used to go barefoot all the time. I thought he grew up in Philadelphia. No, he, they moved to Philadelphia. Oh, okay. He's from North Carolina, okay. probably as a child. He went up to Philadelphia, and they would go back because they had family there, so he'd go back and forth. But he was from North Carolina, and we had a house in North Carolina, so when my wife talked to him one day, they talked a lot about the Cherokees and stuff like that. So Will had a mixed heritage, and he never saw himself, which was ironic. Will was so racially colorblind that it never dawned on him not to date Raquel Welch in 19, what, 60, 58? I don't know when he did. He dated Raquel Welch, the sex symbol of all, who was white, right? But he never dawned on him that that was not a, you know, why, why shouldn't I? Because he didn't, he was so racially colorblind. Whereas Bill Russell was just the opposite. Wasn't it Will to, uh, when you got done interviewing him or talking to him in LA, you got on an airplane, you took the red eye home to Florida, and when you got home, your wife said she'd been talking to Will for two, for two hours because he had called her. I was talking to my wife and I told him how much she liked the North Carolina and, uh, and all that. And, with Will, and uh, he's a very inquisitive guy. So as soon as I left, he called her up. You know, it's LA three hours different. He calls her up, wakes her up. And Pat just left. He told me to tell you he'll be home at six in the morning. And he ended up talking to her for two hours. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, picked me up at the airport. She says, Will kept me up all night. So I called him up. I said, Will, she's an old lady. You want to make her 20,001 in your book? <laughs> I said, leave her alone. 
he left. He died of a heart attack recently. I was, I was shocked. But he was only 63, I think, when he passed away. I know. Away. He was younger. Uh, let's see. How long ago was that? I don't know, but it's longer than one thinks. Yeah, I, I do believe he was about 63 when he died. So I think well, he's probably my age, then. Well, possibly. I would have so. been. Yeah, I'm 67. Yeah, possibly so. Uh, he sort of denigrated his own abilities, you say, because he wanted to prove that he was more than just a basketball player, which he surely was. Well, he was always proven. So I mean, like when he scored, they say that you're only a scorer. When he got 38 rebounds, well, you're only a rebounder. When you, no matter what he did, people always had caveats about it. And so he's constantly jumping from one thing to another, you know? I mean, he's, he's neurotically compelled to excel at everything. And uh, I mean, we, we forget. I mean, these kids talk about Michael Jordan today. Michael Jordan scored 50 points, I think, like 20 times in his career. Will Chamberlain averaged 50 points one year. 88 games, he averaged 50 points. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, Dennis Rodman gets 12 rebounds a game and he leads the league. Will's got 29 rebounds a game. Do you think that there are more guys playing now than in his day who are true physical specimens? He was a true physical specimen. Oh, yeah. He was, he was a strong guy. Yeah. Uh, those guys, I thought, I'm one, I hate to be an old fashioned guy, but I think the guys were better in those days. I think Oscar Robertson, Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor were better than the players today. I think Oscar Robertson was the best guard ever. You're the only person I've met in the last 20 years who agrees with me about that. I think Oscar Robertson, I think basketball in those days was so much better than today. Uh, uh, Bob Pettit, uh, 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 Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, Jerry West, Oscar Robertson. Jerry West and Oscar Robertson, people have no idea how good they were. This is true. This is I true. saw Oscar Robertson score 53 in Madison Square Garden when he was a freshman at the University of Cincinnati. I thought he had 20. It was the quietest 53 yeah, yeah, you ever saw yeah. in your life. Was that the first time he came to the garden where right. he just astounded yeah, everybody? 53. He was on yeah. he was 19 years old. He scored 53 points, and you didn't know he was in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't do helicopter moves. He just didn't miss. Yeah, right, right. And he had, he had the most subtle uh, face. Oscar didn't jump very high. And True. He, he didn't jump. He would not, he didn't, I don't think he ever dunked a ball in his life. But he had the most subtle head fakes. And he always went up when the other guy was coming down. And fake, the other guy would go up, and then Oscar would go up, and they'd pass each other on the way. <laughs> and, and he never missed. Yeah. Oh, he was, a, he was a true marvel. He was a true. And, and I've read some of his stuff. He still thinks he was the best that there ever was. This is right. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, this too. right. You should. Yeah, well, us old guys. Uh, <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, Clemens and Spahn and uh, Glavin. Uh, uh, Clem Clemens, you say he's narcissistic. Wh why do you say that? Well, you know, he's like a child. You think the world revolved around him, you know? I mean. Uh, is, that, is that what you call solipsism in a way? Pretty much. Sol uh, solipsism is where you see the world, you know, like it, it, it rains today, you know, just when I had to go to a picnic. Yeah, you tell us you know, uh, who dropped the world, <laughs> has, the world has, it's third world war going on, yeah, but you know, yeah. it rains always when I'm going out to a picnic. You know? Yeah, you tell a story about the guy who dropped dead when he was running, he said, oh, God, I was running so well today. <laughs> yeah, that's Roger, that's Roger. Um, he, he saw, I mean, you know, he says, says things like, I hope my mo his mother was dying of emphysema. I hope she stays alive to see me go to the Hall of Fame. Not, I hope my mother stays alive because I want my mother to stay alive. Uh, I hope George Posada catches my 300th win. What does George Posada care, care if he catches a win? You know, uh, he names all his kids with K's, Kobe, Kyle, whatever, because K is a strikeout symbol. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's almost laughable. T tell me something. The, uh, uh, one of your magazines, I forget which one, uh, said to you that, boy, you can really tell in the story when you like somebody or when you don't like them, which I think is true based on what I've read. Yeah. And, 
And I get the sense you're at best lukewarm about Clemens. Yeah, I, I didn't dislike him. I mean, I, I felt like I was with a 14-year-old kid with attention deficit disorder. It was not, it was not, I, I didn't think he was a bad guy. I mean, just boring. I mean, he, he thought that it was going to be the greatest moment of my life to spend five days talking to Roger Clemens. That's how solipsistic it was. Not because he's going to say anything interesting or because he's going to be a terrific host or anything like that. He just thought that I would be enraptured by this idea that I was going to spend five days with the rocket man. You know, that happens to be uh, true, doesn't it, of some of the people whom you talk about with regard to O.J. Simpson. They, they would give their, uh, you know, their left arm to spend two days with O.J. Simpson. Some of the people, uh, when, he was, when he was the juice in L.A. before the whole murder thing happened, you could understand it because he was a hell fellow well met. He was a guy's guy. Let's go drinking, let's go chase girls, uh, let's go play golf. Okay. But by the time he got to Miami with this cloud hanging over him, and then there was all these like, this is why I, I tell you I never go to Miami. When you go to Miami, people are always looking to see who might be famous around them. When you live in Fort Lauderdale, people don't care. Yeah. I mean, you go, to, you go to the beach in Fort Lauderdale, people are laughing, having a good time. You go to South Beach in Miami, people are looking over your shoulder to see if Madonna's coming. Yeah. You know, we don't care if Madonna's coming. Yeah. So O.J. became this minor celebrity in Miami where short order cooks and all these people, hangers on, are sort of bask in the glow of some kind of perverse celebrity that he had. I don't know. Well, what, what a human being is just isn't enough for the human being. Is that? I say, what a human being is isn't enough for that human being. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, you speak of, uh, as opposed to, uh, to uh, Clemens, who worked uh, like a dog, I guess, on, his, on these incredibly brutal workouts to build up right. his body. Yeah. Now, did he use drugs? Nobody knows. But, uh, I mean, nobody knows for sure. I have yeah. a theory about that, by the way, which well, I know ahead. now. Go I ahead. Didn't know. I did a story for Playboy on an uh, uh, anti-aging conference in Las Vegas. HGH was the big thing. Human growth hormone, everybody, and I did a lot of research on it. I know more about it than anybody except most doctors. Anyway, HGH <coughs> was invented by Dr. Dan Rudman when his parents began to age prematurely in their 70s. And originally it was used for children. Prematurely? In their 70s? Yeah, but I mean, I'm talking fragile, frail. I don't just mean get older. I mean like they couldn't get out of a chair. Okay. When they were 72 or something. And it, it had been used to treat children that have that aging. Progeria. Disease. You yes, know, the, progeria. Yeah. And it had been successful. And then it had been used children who are on borderline dwarfism because it makes you grow. Right. And anyway, he decided to use it with older people. By the time he discovered it and was able to do, do tests, his parents had died. And he did tests on people between 60 and 70-something. And he found that HGH increased muscle, grew hair, thickened skin, uh, increased energy, increased libido, did everything. It was like a wonder drug. But he only researched this for six months, and his caveat was HGH makes your human growth cells grow, multiply, including the, the dormant cells you have as you get older, including your cancer cells. So if you have dormant cancer cells, Aging is a way to protect you from dying of cancer. In other words, as you age, your cells die off. Well, the cancer cells die off, too. Right. That's why you, we, you may get old and wrinkled and feeble, but you're also getting less chances of getting cancer as you get old. <laughs> so he was worried that this HGH would cause, cause cancer. So he recommended that it be studied for years and years before it was used. Naturally, that didn't happen. It became an anti-aging drug. 
a lot of young hip guys take it for sex because it's, uh, it's, it's the most sexual activity. But the big hidden thing was vast increase in energy levels for people over 40. What do starting pitchers need? Energy. Perfect drug for Roger Clemens. Testosterone is not a perfect drug that, grow, that builds muscle. You know, that muscle is not necessarily what you need as a starting pitcher, but increased energy. You imagine a guy in his early 40s whose legs start getting wobbly in the fourth or fifth inning, take HGH, and they don't get wobbly anymore. Do you think that Barry Bonds took that stuff? I don't know. I don't know. How do you go from 168 pounds to 228 pounds when you're 40 for muscle? <laughs> I guess you've answered that question. Uh, you, you talk about Carlton Fisk when he was, I think, uh, 36 or 38. He was an old man for a catcher. And in, in the winter of 1984, he took up weightlifting big time. Right. A brutal workout schedule. Yeah. It would leave him, leave him literally wobbly. As right. Well. And my question is, if Fisk could build up tremendously uh, greater muscle and endurance just by doing that. Nobody's ever associated Fisk with drugs. Right. Well, why couldn't that have happened to Bonds and Clement as they claimed it did? Well, because it's more hard work. I don't know. I don't know why. I mean. But you don't think it did happen? Well, I mean, you with, made with, that. With you Fisk? Made I don't know anything about Fisk. I don't, I, no, I don't, no, know. I don't mean Fisk. Yeah. But there was no HGH in those days. Yeah. So, you know, I know he didn't take HGH. He could have he could have taken steroids, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, why did they, I, I don't know, a shortcut? I mean, Jose Canseco, the biggest drug user in baseball, is the laziest guy in baseball. He never liked to work out, so he took drugs instead. Well, um, um, you say that uh, Clemens was intent on remaining a power pitcher, a fastball pitcher. Right. Where Spahn and Glavin early on, relatively speaking, 35, 36, 34, yeah. uh, started working on uh, slow curves, sliders. Not, uh, not, not, not quite, uh, Glavin never threw hard. So he, 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 had to, he had to be fine all the way through. Spani was a fastball pitcher when he came up, 25, 26. And he was one of the smartest pitchers. He knew that every pitcher's career was like a graph. Start out 24, 25, the big leagues got going up. 30, you're at your peak, 25 game winner. And then 31, 32, start 32, you start going down. You're losing your fastball. You go down, and if you don't discover something new, you're out of the baseball by 35. So Spani's attitude was some guys wait until they lose their stuff and then say, oh, I have to come up with another pitch. And it takes them two years to come up with another pitch at which point they're 8 and 15, 9 and 15, then they're 12 and 12, then they're 16 and 10 again, okay? He says, I don't want to wait to lose those two years. So while he was a fastball pitcher, he began experimenting with off-speed pitches. Like he picked up a change-up screwball, slider. Spani used to be just basically overhand fastball, overhand curve, you know, classic left-handed Josh Beckett. While he was at the peak of his game, he was still working on other pitches. So Spani never had that valley. Yeah, yeah. You, you look at his career, you never see the drop-off that you see in the 30s that you would see with most other pitchers. He just kept winning 25 games all the way through his 30s until he was 40. He ended up with, what, 363 wins? 363 wins. Somebody once told me Steve Carlton was the greatest left-hander who ever lived. I said, excuse me. Go check Warren Spahn's record. Right. And you know, Sp of course, Spahn, like Ted Williams, lost three years to the war. Sure. That's why he didn't come up till he was 25. Yeah. So Williams lost more than that. He was in two wars. Well, he lost, I think he lost a total of four years over two wars. Yeah, he was in the Korean War. He was in the F Second World War. Yeah, he lost about, two, I don't know, maybe 180 home runs, something like that. Uh, but Spahn lost, well, he, he didn't come up till he was 25, whereas otherwise he would have come up when he was 22, something, something yeah, like that. So 22, so even if you won 10 games a year, I mean, uh, 
22, 23, 24, he would have won 30 games, so he would have been close to 400 victories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Uh, wh what did Glavin do? Glavin was, uh, I talked to Tommy when he was, uh, years ago. He was never, I asked him why he doesn't throw more curveballs and all that, and well, you know. He said, I was always a nibbler. He said, I was never a power pitcher. Yeah. He said, so he, you know, I mean, he was all, what killed Glavin and Maddox was when they redefined the strike zone with the umpires a couple years ago. They were outside, inside pitches, you know, six inches off the plate, and the umpires used to call out. Now the umpires are calling more up and down, and they can't throw up and down. Hey, tell me something. I mean, they can, but they'll get hurt. I, I read a, a, a baseball book uh, recently by Tom Verducci. Who, uh, you must know because he writes for Sports Illustrated. Uh, uh, Another name. Yeah. And he said that what happened in baseball is that guys like Glavin and Maddox, by nibbling at the corners for a while, caused the umpires to extend the lateral range of the plate. Right. At the same time, when you and I were kids, a up here was a strike. Right. You, you had to come down here to be I don't know strike. what happened, but somewhere along the line, it's, the strike zone shrunk. It became from the waist to above the knees. That was a strike. But it stretched. It became six inches outside, six, uh, six inches inside. It became, well, not inside, because six inches inside, you hit the guy in the knees. It became an outside thing. And uh, uh, remember the game Levon Hernandez pitched in the World Series? Struck out 15 batter. And I think Greg was the umpire. Boris Greg, I'm not sure of his last name. Those pitches were a foot outside. He was calling strikes. One of the reasons is umpires can't see the outside pitch good. The old days, umpires used to wear the inflated chest protectors. Yeah. And they would stand directly over the, the catcher. Right. So they couldn't see a low pitch because they're looking down on the ball and they, they can't see whether the ball is six inches off the ground or knee high. But they could see left or right perfectly. Right, right, right. right? When they got the inside protectors, in order to see, they had to crouch over the, the catcher's shoulder. So now here's the catcher, here's the batter, and the umpire is over here looking on this level. You can see the inside pitch, you can see the up and down pitch. You can't see whether the outside pitch is an inch off the corner or six inches off the corner. That's when the outside strike all of a sudden became a pitch. And once pitchers picked up on it, they just started going farther and far outside and seeing when the umpires would stop Pat, why, why did they? why did they take away the hot? In our day, we wouldn't have called it the high strike. We would have called it, you know, a regular level strike. Why, from, from the belly button to uh, the waist, to the belly, why did they take that away as a strike? And how did, the, the rule still reads the same. From, from the letters? Actually, I think it's under the armpits, isn't it? Well, I think that's right. It, it used to be the, the shoulders back in the late 40s, yeah. early 50s, and they changed it to the armpits. Under the armpits, and then it was the letters. I don't know exactly where it is anymore. It doesn't matter. You can't throw the ball above well, the belt. You know, it's like basketball when they talk about the change. It, one of the, uh, uh, in the old days when you played, you had a dribble. You couldn't palm it, and you couldn't Everybody take it. Everybody palms the ball these days. Well, well that's well, how you, you dribble now. Well, Fraser started that. Did he? Well, I played it for the uh, Knicks. They told him he couldn't get away with it. He said, watch me. I mean, he just carries the ball. He would, he would literally carry the ball. Who, who started in basketball, who started the business about one and a half, well, you used to get one and a half steps. Now it's two, two and a half. Oh, that I don't know, but I know, I know Fraser started the, the, the carrying the ball with you. These things change the nature of the game dramatically in both baseball, I think, and basketball. Like basketball now, they beat each other up underneath in a way they never used to. Yeah. I mean, guys used to uh, drive to the hoop and didn't get murdered. Today, they murder you. I mean, I saw, I saw a game, uh, uh, San Antonio, and I forgot who it was, and I got a seat right underneath the basket. Yeah, yeah. Guys are killing each other under there. Talk about fouls. You know, no, no blood, no foul. More like a boys club game than a suburb, yeah. suburban I mean, game. I said, who wants to drive into that mess? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, to go back to, the, to some of this stuff, you, you say, and I'd like you to explain your feeling about this, that if Seaver took drugs. Seaver never took a drug. I, I don't mean, I don't, sorry, not uh, Seaver. Uh, 
uh, if, uh, if uh, or Clemens? Clemens took drugs, the person he should apologize to is Tom Seavey. Right. And explain why you feel that way. I went and checked the, the records. And at the same ages, 38 to 40 or 41 when Seaver retired, Seaver was an under 500 pitcher, and Roger Clemens was winning MVP, a Cy Young Award. That's the mark. Seaver, was, Seaver had a superior career to Clemens until the age of 38. And Clemens shot past him from 38 on when he was starting to take drugs, okay? And if Seaver had ever taken drugs, he would have won 355 games instead of 311. So Seaver struggled along as, an, as a 10 and 12 pitcher, 38, 39, 40, I think he retired at 40 or 41, whatever. And Clemens was on, went on to 44 years old. And that's where it really kicked in. It wouldn't help Clemens at 28 or 31. But in his late 30s, it was early 40s. He won games. He had, he had better records than he did when he was 20, 28 at Boston. Yeah. Well, just like Bonds. Yeah. I mean, what, very, Hank Aaron hit 35 home runs all his life. He never hit 60, 50 home runs. All right? So his home run record is legitimate. Plus, Hank was a wiry guy. I mean, I pitched against him. Did you? I mean, he was not a big guy at all. And um, so his home runs were legitimate. Barry Bonds is 168 pounds, and when he turned 40, he's 240 of muscle. It looked, what happened? He was tuna fish and, and uh, broiled chicken. I was in bodybuilding contests when I was 40. I ate tuna fish and broiled chicken for days, you know, and I couldn't gain muscle like that. Uh, one of the most interesting things in this entirely fascinating book is that in, this, in, in, in uh, talking about your view that uh, Clemens should apologize to Seaver, you say you hate phonies. I am, quote, I think it's a quote, I'm furious with phonies. And you talk about, is it Dave Peltzer who wrote a book in which he claimed to be an orphan and he wasn't? Oh, he'd be abused by his mother. And you talk about, uh, in, a, in the other direction, you talk about the fellow who wrote Cold Mountain and your view of Cold Mountain. The guy who wrote Cold Mountain was not a phony. I understand. I, I separated between Peltzer. Uh, I, I was just trying to make a point that I wasn't being bitter at writers who had made successful written successful books. I said Peltzer's book was a fraud, which always infuriated me, because when I did research on it, I found out none of it happened. He just fantasized, like the, the guy uh, Fry, James Fry, who wrote this, and also the uh, other uh, person who was just exposed for having written a fraudulent biography. I forgot who it was. Anyway, whereas Charles Mountain wrote a real book, I just didn't happen to, it wasn't my cup of tea. Now, why do you think, see, uh, the question I have for you, as you know, is I and a, a friend whom I've uh, written about have some kind of uh, unhealthy uh, uh, di uh, attitude, <laughs> how should I put this, an unhealthy hatred of phonies. I mean, I think we carry it to the point of unhealthiness. Eh? We really despise them. And obviously, you do too. And uh, the three of us are, you know, whatever your age is or my age, it can't be more than two years apart in the, uh, yeah. any direction. So it, was this something that was a 1950s phenomenon? I don't know. I don't know. I, I never liked guys who picked on people, you know, bullies, for example. Right. You know, I mean, w when I was a kid in a boys' club, you never picked up a weapon if you got in a fight. You had to fight somebody one up. You didn't hit him over the head with a brick. You didn't stab him. And you certainly didn't shoot him. I mean, the idea was not that you beat the guy, but it was how you beat the guy. If you stood up and you had a fist fight with a kid in the gym and you knocked him down, okay. But you didn't wait until he turned his back on you and hit him over the head with a brick. I don't know whether that was our generation or what. And anybody who had to use a weapon 
was a coward, not a hero. You know, like you, you read about these drive-by shootings. What do you mean? You drive by people who are having dinner and shoot into their house? What is that supposed to mean? Do you, do you think that uh, this taste for phonies, which doesn't seem to be as pronounced today, uh, it, it, does this have something to do uh, with the celebrification of American sure, society? Uh, we're only interested in success. We don't care. We don't care how the person got it, or, or, or uh, whether it's a success. Our terms of success is somebody who's famous and rich, Paris Hilton, who I happen to think is probably more substantial than she lets on. Yeah, that's my theory. <laughs> Smart enough not to let on. Huh? Right. Not, <laughs> it's better to be thought a fool than speak and prove it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so she, I think she might be shrewder than people give her credit for. Uh, um, for example, I, I'm not a Madonna fan. You know, assuming some persona and then changing it. And, you know, who are you? You know, you're a little guinea chick from Detroit. You know? What, what um, speaking of, you know, who are you? She was a fine athlete, used to play with the boys at oh, best. Kathy Reese, she, when I was a kid, when we played basketball before I went to the North End Boys Club, she would come and play with the boys. She was 14, a little, a little older than us. Anyway, Kathy, uh, Kathy was obviously a lesbian. We knew something was, she wasn't, she was a tomboy, but she was a lesbian. And she uh, was a terrific basketball player, but the boys wouldn't let her play, you know, a girl. And, and uh, one day she got mad at me for something. She chased me down the street, and I was laughing at her, being chased by a girl. The joke was, if Kathy ever caught me, she would have beat the crap out of me. It was a tough cookie. Well, you ran into her later in life, I guess. And uh, she, uh, Later in life, she had a girlfriend or partner or whatever. And uh, just once, I said hello and all. She was a little embarrassed, but at that point, you know, I was never, I was never, I never really had any friction. I grew up in a very liberal Italian house, and I, not liberal in the Massachusetts way. Now you, you've overcome your back on that. Yeah, so I keep coming <laughs> back to that. I can, what, what did I say to you? I can't smoke in this state, but I could marry a man if I want. <laughs> I find that, I find that fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. smoke yeah. in the entire state. Anyway, so uh, nobody got kicked. By liberal, I mean free, uh, free thinking. My mother and father imposed on me never to judge anybody by anything other than the kind of person they were, and uh, uh, like uh, being gay or uh, Jew or black or Latin or whatever. The only thing my parents hated were the Irish, and that was for a very simple reason. When my grandmother had a bootleg wine store during a, during the prohibition she had to pay the irish cop five dollars on the beat to keep open and so therefore we had to hate the irish because we had to pay tribute to the irish cop you know one, one of the things that i found out and we have to wrap this one of the things i found out when i came up here from washington 22 years was 20 years ago was about the uh, enmity around here between irish americans and italian americans and one of the things that uh, I only half jokingly say I'm most proud of is that yeah. in starting the school, I got them to work together beautifully. <laughs> well, you know, it's a funny thing. And all the time I went to Italy, Florence, our friends there, they love to go to Ireland. They say they're the most like Italians of any people. It's totally social, uh, societal in America. And in Europe, the Italians and the Irish have more in common than anybody. They like to talk, they uh, like to drink, they like to be convivial, they, you know what I mean? They like to eat. They get, they, my Italian friends all go to Ireland for vacation and the Irish all come to Italy for vacation. I said it's, it's all has to do with society. Well, we have to wrap this up. Thank you. Thank really you, my appreciate pleasure. It. A fine book. To the audience, I recommend that you read it if you want a really fine read. And uh, also to the audience, be with us again next time for the next installment of Books of Our Time. And Pat, thank you.